Have you ever seen this picture floating around the internet? Have you ever wondered what the heck it was and how it was obtained? Well, you're in luck. Today, we will dive headfirst into these plots. Welcome everyone. I am a science nerd covering the joys of quantum mechanics, and in today's video, we will discuss how to construct the spatial wave function for hydrogen, with, of course, a bonus at the end. By the end of this video, you will be able to identify the hydrogen wave function this big clunker here, normalize the radial wave function, use that to construct the spatial wave function, and then of course plot and interpret the graphs of the hydrogen wave function. So all of these beautiful looking things here. All right, let's see what we're actually tasked with doing. In this problem, we want to normalize the particular state R of 2, 0, which is given below. Um, this is also known as the radial wave function, which we'll dive into. And then we want to construct the total spatial wave function here, which is lowercase psi of this particular state. And then, of course, we want to do that for a couple more states just to make sure that we know what's going on. Before we begin, though, I would like to mention that there is a free companion PDF that you can use to follow along. The link is below. All right, so let's talk a little bit about setup first. We know that from Chapter 2 and mainly Chapter 1, that we discussed the need for normalization. Now that we're going into three dimensions, that still has to be true. Meaning that the normalization condition extends to the three dimensions and instead of a single integral, we have a volume integral indicated here. And we also know that this has to be true for the total wave function. Noticing that we've been keeping up with separation of variables, this is representative of capital uh, psi in LM of R theta phi and T. Okay, so we have all parts together here, the radial, the angular, and the time dependent. And we notice that in the magnitude squared, that time dependent goes bye-bye due to the complex nature of the exponential. And we're left with this setup here. So now what we realize is that in order for the uh, normalization to work, we have to settle this through through the spherical coordinates, which changes this dv term into the r squared sine theta dr d phi d theta. It's not just a box like we had before. You go back to multivariable calculus, or I can rederive that for you with the Jacobian if you'd like. Nonetheless, it's different now. And so what we have to do is split this up into a radial part and an angular part, where we have an r squared coming from dv over our bounded region from zero to infinity. And then our angular part has to go with a sine theta over zero to pi for theta and zero to two pi for phi. So everything is starting to come together now from things we've learned in multivariable. And all we are tasked with doing in this particular question is using this radial part here and using that to normalize the given states. So let's go ahead and check that out. So then, here in part A, what we realize is that we were given R of 2, 0, and this means that N equals 2 and L equals 0, as the colors, color coordination suggests. Understanding these forms and being able to identify what they are is half the battle sometimes in many of the physics classes, but especially in quantum mechanics. So I like color coordinating for that fact. But now, as we saw previously, we need to use the radial part of that normalization factor or normalization setup to now solve for what we know as C0, which was given in the initial um, function statement. Here, though, let's recall that in our last question, we used the recursion relation to find what these uh, polynomials were attached to the exponential, and we noticed that they all led to a term of C0. The goal of the normalization now is to find out what this C0 is, such that this integral statement is true. So that is the goal here, and now we can just algebra our way through. Noting here that the radial part is all real, so we can just square everything, as we see here. In so squaring, what we realize is that this leads to another polynomial, which we see in the parentheses here. And from that, we can distribute the R squared here from there and the exponential, which reduced by a factor of two, thanks to the square. Um, and 
when we do this, what we see is that we're in a perfect situation to set up for the tables in the book. Let's see how that is applied. So when we distribute and split everything up due to linearity of integrals and all that other fancy stuff, uh, what we see here is that we have a some degree of r times an exponential with the negative r in it, and of course over dr. Here we have a r of 2, of r of 3, and an r of 4. And in the integral tables, which again is highlighted in the PDF in a little more uh, detail, we set up the whole chart for you. Um, but nonetheless, what we realize here is that the n of 2 for 1, n equals 3 for 2, and n equals 4 for 3, these lead to the expansions here. Uh, you could go ahead and integrate by parts and all the other fancy stuff, but that is not the point of what we're trying to do. The author gives us tables in the book, so utilize them to save you time and just form match like we've seen in several other instances. It just doesn't make sense to use your time on that when you're trying to understand the physics. So note, note that your tools are available for that, and now we can simplify down. The result of these uh, terms here lead to a 2a cubed, and then we have a 1 over a that we carry along from the distribution, and then we get a 6a to the 4th from the integral, similarly a 24a to the 5th, Noticing here that the color coordination happens again. The red cancel sign means I get rid of the term completely, and the purple means that I reduce in factor. So 24 divided by 4 leaves me with a factor of 6. And then we have a squared divided by, or a to the fifth divided by a squared, so that reduces the factor to 3, and so on and so forth. All the fancy algebra. What we notice here is that 2 and 3 when they're uh, simplified, cancel one another out, how convenient. And then we're left again with another case where we need to simplify this 2a cubed. And we see that the factors here cancel and um, simplify down. So now we can finally solve for c naught, which we will see shortly. Recalling then that the integral itself must equal 0 or must equal 1, we set the simplified form equal to 1 again. And now we just push this over. Multiply by 2, divide by a, easy enough, we get c squared, take the positive root. And so that's pretty simple, I would say, uh, just revisiting things we've seen for a couple chapters now. Uh, now with just, of course, a slight extension to the three dimensions but and a different coordinate system, but nothing terrifying. Now, the fun part. Let's compose the spatial wave function, which we know is a function of r theta phi, but this time we have a composition of three numbers here the blue is in we have l equals in the green and then we have the m which is in red we've taken a look at these parts separately with the angular equation which was the green and red and the radial equation which was the uh, green or the blue and green now we put them all together into one form here is the radial part and the radial part here is of the two zero the first two numbers and this is the angular part, which is from the last two numbers, so green and red. And we saw that we found the angular part of, or y00, back in, I believe, question 4.4. Uh, I'll link it below because I don't remember off the top of my head. But nonetheless, we see that we can now put together all the variables back into what we were starting with, what, when we were trying to separate them. Blah, can't talk. Uh, but nonetheless, now we can just simplify since we have the c naught here, and when we do so, we end up with a 1 over square root of 2 pi a, and then times a 1 over 2a from here. The 2 pi comes from this 2, canceling down with this 4, and this square root. So all in all, not too bad for this particular case. I would say this one's pretty easy. The next, uh, in the next case, we have to take a little more careful when we put the two together, but we'll see that in due time. And in due time means now. So for B then, in the case of our first case of this rather, we need to first normalize R of 2, 1. Again, meaning that N equals 2 and L equals 1. Use the same methodology we did before. Square this. This time we don't have a big polynomial, but we could still use the results of the R to the fourth integral trick from the table. And so we quote the 24a to the fifth, noticing here that we get a lot of cancellations, so easy enough. Just be careful with canceling out completely. 
noticing here that we're left with a 3a in the bracket and a 2 down here we can simplify this really really quickly into that form solve it again push it over to the 1 and then take the square root and we're left with c naught equals square root of 2 over 3a so you can kind of tell that we have a repeat um a repeat pattern with these square roots and we could actually generalize this normalization fact but that gets really messy and we'll deal with that later there is a video incoming about that so keep your head on a swivel or notifications on a swivel i don't know but nonetheless let's continue forward and see how we can construct these wave functions all right so as stated now we have to take a little more care with constructing these Noticing here that the total function needs to be of n, l, and m, which here we have a 2, 1, and m varies from the given statement. So we put together the radial part, which is of state 2, l, or state n equal 2, l equal 1. Here, the l doesn't change, but the m does. So we keep the spherical part, the spherical harmonic part, with the variable at m until we set up cases for m. So that being said, let's go ahead and dive into the simple case of m equals 0. Simple, all due respect. Here we saw that we can find this in the table that's in the book or whatever other reference you'd like. What we see here is that for m equals 0 and l equal 1, we get a 3 over 4 pi cosine. Here we plug in the c naught for the normalization term on the radial function that was given. And of course, just a little bit of algebra tidies these things together quite nice. Not bad at all. Uh, just be aware that the square roots simplify kind of weird. And you could also just put all these square roots together. Um, go check out the PDF for that. And we'll see maybe that that is a more advantaged uh, setup for when we go to plot these things. All right, let's get on to the interesting case then. And here, oops. And here we see that m is between plus 1 and minus 1. And we could solve these jointly because we know of the forms that we're dealing with. Here we have 2, 1, and plus or minus 1. Easy enough. We just keep that width. The hard part now comes in when we're looking at the table. We need to be able to read this across. So plus here reads to a minus here and a plus in the e. And then a minus reads to a plus on the square root and a minus in the e. So just be aware, reading these off it can be a little tedious. And now that that's highlighted in red, we can see it kind of transcend through. The minus plus structure gets pushed out front with the constants. As you see, we can tidy up this square root as such. And here we get a nice simplification of sine. We actually get three variables now, the radius, the theta, and the phi. That is pretty cool. We like to see that. The interesting part to note here is that Although we have a really complex looking function, if we go to plot these things, because we know that we can only plot the uh, magnitude squared, this phi term doesn't do anything. So we know because regardless of whatever case we have of m equal plus or m equal minus, the conjugate is going to flip that. And so that is something to pay attention to when we look at the graphs. But also note that that tells us that our phi is going to stay symmetric about the z-axis. So just be aware that those kind of things keep coming up and we'll take a look at the symmetries that we have from that. But as you would expect in spherical coordinates and central potentials, we get something that is symmetric about a particular axis. So without further ado, let's go take a look at these graphs. All right, so we were told that we had a that we were looking for the wave function of the state 2, 0, 0. And that's what this is here. Noticing here that we're pretty boring, but we're highly concentrated at the center. And we see that we have a black ring here, and then we have some more little dusty clouds there. This is what's called the hydrogen atom wave function electron density. This is what we saw in the very beginning with a whole bunch of different states. And in fact, let's take a look at some more states. Just let this cycle through because you're going to see a lot of repeats. It's a lot of fun to deal with these. It's a lot of fun to program these. We see them all the time and it's really fun. So now that it's cycled through a few times, I think we can note that when we have zeros in there, we see that we have only a case where, um, with respect to 
what's going on inside. We are left with something that just looks like a, a sphere, right? A dot. And that tells us that we're not having much of any interest there outside of it just being a radial component. And that's it. When we see all these little flowering buds happening, that's when we have the theta acting up. And theta is, again, from uh, the positive Z to the negative Z. And that is what's causing these weird little nodal lines. And we'll dive into that in the next section where we talk about how to interpret these. So we'll let that cycle for one more time and then move on. All right, so how to actually dive into these things and see what is going on. We notice here that there's a lot moving around. So um, with that, what we can do is look at it in a three dimensional sense. Here I found this on a physics stack exchange. I don't remember which one, but I'll go and try to link it up. And what we see here is that for the two uh, for the two sets of density plots here, what we have is the state of n equals three, l equals two, and m equals zero. And they're saying the same thing, but again, perspective matters. And if it wasn't for the fact that these were really clunky to compose, we'd have looking at these instead. Um, this is uh, these graphs, by the way, were produced in Python, which you can look in GitHub. I'll link the repository below because it's quite fascinating. I did a little editing for what I wanted, but you're more than welcome to go check it out. All right, so the big points here is that we have two bulbs here up top where you see the green and purple fade, where we get more intense towards the middle and we get less intense outside. We have a symmetric about the what we call the nodal plane or the XY plane. And so here that stays intense. So this purple here is what this white is here. We see that we're really intense towards the exact middle here. And then this little donut that is holding the orbital together, that is what these little clouds are right here. So we're saying the same thing, except this is just a pure cross section analysis of it. This is more of a 3D model with a certain amount of phi um, uh, cut out of it. Um, and again, this is the kind of plots that the author put in the book. So there's definitely a lot of reference material for it, but it definitely helps to be able to understand they're both representing the same thing. Just this is a pure cross section. This is a, um, a quarter section cut out so you can see the intensities in there. I believe this was made in Mathematica, so you can definitely go play and look at that yourself. What's interesting here is that we can observe things wherever we see that these where we have really dark lines here and here. These are called the nodal planes or the nodal spots where there is no probability there. Remember that the cosine or sine function from the theta part will make to where these things jump to zero. And we saw that back in the square well in chapter one that with increasing energy level, we got increasing nodes. Right. So now we see that these nodal line nodal points are now turning into nodal lines in the case of 2D and in 3D they turn into nodal planes. So everything that we've finalized from that theorem in chapter two, I think 2.1, we are now seeing coming back in full force in three dimensions. How cool is that? So to summarize, we have covered normalizing a radial wave function for the various states, constructing the hydrogen uh, spatial wave function for these various states, and of course, graphing and interpreting these wave functions. These are just fascinating, aren't they? So beautiful. If you enjoyed this, please consider supporting the channel by subscribing and sharing with a fellow curious person. Books, notes, and other reference materials can be found below. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out here or at one of the links below. Probably Instagram is the easiest. As always, thank you for watching and until next time, stay curious and happy learning.